I understand it within your faith and, and you indeed as a, as a person, if you saw someone breaking into your neighbor's house and your neighbor was away, you would, first thing you would do is report, report it to the police, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's true. And if you received um, reliable information, and I understand this is hypothetical, I hope this, you've never been in this position, but if you received reliable information that uh, a murder was planned, the first thing you do is report it to the police. That's true. But if you receive a report that a child has been abused within a family, for example, in your community, you don't report it to the police. Okay. Now, can you explain the, the distinction? Why would that be? Yeah, I, uh, I would say again, as uh, I read from the New South Wales booklet, as I strongly believe myself, as the scriptural principles highlight, we respect the, the rights of the individuals, the family, the survivor in the case of a, uh, an adult, as in the two cases that have been considered, to make that uh, determination. Um, we've not said that we've had a, pro a procedure or a process of uh, automatically reporting it to the authorities. Uh, the Commission has brought to our attention that there, in addition to mandatory reporting, there are other um, legal implications to having those uh, having that information um, but I, I understand your point our process has been to respect the, the rights of the, the individual or uh, the family and I think as has been previously quoted from 2 Corinthians 124 it says we're not the masters over your faith we're fellow workers for your joy and Galatians 6 5 says each of us shall carry our own load of responsibility. So we, um, it's been mentioned that we control every aspect of family life. That's not the, tr not the case. We respect the rights of families to make some of those decisions, but I, I do understand your point. Well, is it, is it not the case, Mr. Spinks, that it's because child sexual abuse is regarded as a sin within the Jehovah's Witness faith? Is very serious sin, I'll, I'll grant you that, but it's regarded as a sin, but hasn't been recognised to be a crime. Well, that's totally wrong. Not only is that printed, uh, that we view uh, child abuse as a, a sin and a crime, there is no worse sin and crime than child abuse. So I understand the basis for you expressing that, but that is totally the opposite to the truth with Jehovah's Witnesses. No further questions. Can you, Mr. Speaks, just help me to understand the role of women in the Jehovah's Witness Church? Um, there are some fairly strict biblical New Testament um, injunctions about the role of women. Are they adhered to by your church? Um, I promise to give a short answer, uh, Your Honour. I we have such respect for our wives and women. Um, we, re we see scripturally that the role of teaching in the congregation um, is for the elders, for the men, who does the bulk of the, the preaching work and adds the momentum, my wife, the other wives. We, we have a reputation for showing great respect for our wives. I understand the, 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 what you're saying in 21st century Australia for a religious or faith-based organisation to say that the men are going to be elders. I understand the challenge, but that's our, our scriptural stand. But are you saying to me women can't be teachers in the church? I it? think, I th when that was discussed previously, if we're saying, as in a church situation, the priest at the pulpit or whatever, uh, we understand scripturally that's the role of the elders. Are the women involved in, uh, in teaching, in the public preaching work, in the bulk of the ministry? Yes, they are. They do the bulk of that work, but I, I, I'm are not trying allowed, to... Are they allowed to speak in the church? <laughs> uh, I think anyone who's been to one of our congregation meetings would say a resounding yes to that. Um, Corinthians says they can't. Uh, the context there 
is the elder minister priest standing up and giving a Bible lecture to the congregation. That's the role of the elders. The women, um, as with all others, uh, non-elders, amongst the men, our children, they all participate, question and answer, commenting freely and presentations off the platform. We'll just look at 1 Corinthians yep. uh, 14, 34 and 35 for me. departed from the scripture in your current practice? Uh, not at all, um, Bill, and I think... Well, uh, would you read them out so everyone knows what we're talking about? 34 and 35? Yeah. Very good. Well, you better start at 33, I suppose. Okay. It says, uh, for God is uh, God not of disorder but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Holy Ones, uh, let the women keep silent in the congregation, for it is not permitted for them to speak... Rather, let them be in subjection, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful, disgraceful for a woman to speak in the congregation. Well, do you follow that injunction or not? Uh, in the, if, if, if we read the whole chapter, I'm not suggesting that we do, but if we read the whole chapter, we'll see that the reason it starts with a God of um, disorder... Uh, not of disorder but of peace, is that there was disruption um, in the congregation and the Apostle Paul, who I might mention was a single lawyer, uh, spoke in a language that we would certainly uh, phrase a little differently today. His point was it was the role of the men to stand up and teach God's word um, from, the, uh, from the pulpit, the platform, and so... Do we try and over-literally interpret that? The, the, the Gospels are full of the women doing the preaching and sharing in the work in the congregation. That's just a, a really strong statement addressing a particular situation. So you don't follow that one? Uh, we, we do not have uh, sisters who are elders teaching from the pulpit, but they are actively involved in speaking and discussions and question and answer. Asking questions. So the answer to my question is you don't follow that injunction. Well, it's out of context, I'm sorry, uh, Your Honour, because the context is the priest preaching from the pulpit. All right. All right. Just on, on, yeah. on that, I think the transcript may have picked up the wrong reference. Is it 1 Corinthians 14? I think the verses were wrong, 34 and 35. 33, 34 and 35. Um, chapter 14. 14, yeah. Thank you. 33, 34 and 35. I mean, there are other references in a similar vein, and you probably travel this territory many times, haven't you? Because, as you know, many churches don't interpret and apply those injunctions in the literal way that your church does. Uh, that's correct. You know that? Yeah, I do. Does anyone else have any questions? I do, Your Honour, if I may. Well, who goes first? All right, I do, I think. All right. Okay, Ms McGlinchey. Um, uh, Mr Spinks, um, my name is Miss McGlinchey and I represent Monty Baker in these proceedings. Um, uh, Mr Spinks, can I just ask, does the, does the Jehovah's Witness Church uh, conduct children's activities such as Sunday school or Bible classes for children? Uh, no. They don't? No. They don't have any child activities? No. Even creches? No. Childcare centres, anything like that? No. All right. So there's no activity where children are supervised alone with a Jehovah's Witness volunteer? That's correct. Thank you. Um, Mr Spinks, could you look at uh, paragraph, your first statement, paragraph 66? To ask you some questions about the role of the regular pioneers. Now, as I understand it from the viewpoint of a lay person, a regular pioneer preaches in the community in public. Is that correct? Yeah, all of Jehovah's Witnesses preach publicly in the community. A regular pioneer is someone that says, I, I want to expand my ministry, but what you say is correct. Yeah. So they, the regular pioneers, may preach um, in a public place, such as a 
shopping centre or something like that? Yes. All right. That they also go door to door and knocking yes. on people's doors and yes. attempting to engage people in conversation and to uh, communicate to them your uh, understanding of the world. Is that correct? That's correct. Or Jehovah's understanding of the world? Yes. All right. And that may also involve going back on a number of occasions and taking part in family discussions and um, uh, returning to the home and being invited into the home. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses conduct uh, Bible studies with uh, people, yes. All right. I'm um, talking now in particular about the role of the regular pioneer, mm -hmm. not, not generally. Do you understand that? Sure. Okay. Now, um, there is, um, the, and, and as I understand it, the, the regular pioneer um, strategy, for want of a better word, has been quite successful in growing the flock around the world. I, I don't know how to quantify that. I guess right. I, I have no reason to question it. I guess a missionary, a special pioneer, a regular pioneer is by nature going to spend more time in the preaching work. All right. Now, uh, can you? The, uh, there is an application to become a regular pioneer. You can't just decide yourself that you're a regular pioneer. You have to need to go through a process. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, anyone can expand their ministry, but as a regular yes. pioneer, that's right. There's an application. And that application form is attached to your first statement. That's could, we, could we look at that, please? Do you have that in front of you? Uh, I do. All right. Now, there are a number of questions that the applicant is asked about their, uh, that it would be considered in whether they're an appropriate person or not. In the question six, number C, you ask, have you ever engaged in child sexual molestation? Yes. All right. Okay. Now, the next one, D, if yes, when? Correct? Correct. All right. So you would be expecting a person to disclose that to you and you would ask further questions such as when? That's correct. All right. And the next question is, are you now a good mor of good moral standing and habits? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Now, w would I be right in assuming that a person who does declare that they have engaged in child sexual molestation, if they are now a person of good moral standing and habits, would not be necessarily prohibited from taking on the role of regular pioneer? Is that correct? Um, I'm just trying to unravel the question there, but um, right. I think if, if uh, in question six there are a whole um, list of things, and yes. the following question in seven, uh, are you now of good moral standing and habits? If your question is, if somebody says, yes, I engaged in child sex sexual molestation, um, that uh, consideration would then be given as to whether they would be um, allowed to regular pioneer. All right. That's if, that's if they honestly answered the question, of course. Of course. But we're only dealing with if they say yes. So um, answering yes to that question would not prohibit you from taking part in being a regular pioneer. Uh, the short answer is yes, it would. The longer answer is, depending on the circumstances, as we've openly provided information, so perhaps if it was decades ago, um, uh, I don't want to say anything to minimise or, or compare the nature of offences, but we deal with situations where perhaps a, a very immature 22-year-old is involved with a you know, mature 16-year-old. They might even end up marrying or whatever. But there are situations where, by definition, it's um, child sexual molestation. Um, we don't want to condone um, a child abuser by allowing them to, as the organised to accomplish God's will book says, they should be exemplary and known to be exemplary. All right. So what, if a person says yes, but they also say they are now of good moral standing and habits, what further inquiries do you make? Um, the elders are um, instructed, there is a, a letter, by the way, it's in the submission, or in the tender mm -hmm. documents. I believe it's July 2014, thereabouts, that actually sets out the process. So the elders would then get all the details of that and write to the branch office. So it would be held up at that point 
as soon as the um, remembering that this is the document that's given to the applicant. Yes. As soon as that um, person puts yes to question C, uh, yes, the application is held up, and and then we'd start that process of um, discussing with the branch office what details are known about that. All right. And are there a set of guidelines that you would use that in assessing that, or would it just be the judgment of the elders? I would, no, they contact the branch office. So the full oh, the details office. are provided to the branch office. The, um, the principles of the S66 guidelines that have been um, just uh, looked at before and the Bible principles, the same is applied in the situation. All right. Is there any external checks that you would undertake? And by external, I mean, for example, a, a police records check. Would you seek one of those? I uh, think it's we've... I mean, our documents show that where uh, working with children check is required by for ministers, I think there's about 7,000 now, but for a regular pioneer, um, we have no um, requirement um, at this stage that that's the right. case. Can I just get you to address your mind to a, a situation which I'm suggesting of a person has said yes, but they've also, to that question, that they have engaged in child sexual molestation. They're also saying that they're now of moral standing, good moral standing and habits. And I understand that there's a process with head office, but would you, in that circumstance, seek any external um, um, tests for that, such as a criminal records history? I think we've... Is that the answer, no? The answer is no. All right. Would, in that circumstance, you require a person to provide a uh, working with children check? Uh, that's not been the case. So the answer is no? Correct. All right. Are there any criminal matters which, simply by having a record of that criminal matter, such as rape, that would, in every case, exclude you from being accredited as a regular pioneer? Could you repeat that again, please? Sure. All right. Are there any offences, such as rape, that would in every case exclude you from taking up a position as a regular pioneer? Uh, I think for me to give a... You've asked an absolute question there. I have. So my, my answer is, is for the reasons I explained earlier, um, I, I don't think I could say absolutely that 20, 30, 40 years down the, down the track on some specific situations. The question is too absolute and hypothetical, so I, well, I can't answer in the positive. All right. Okay, so the answer is either no or you don't know. <laughs> I think the answer is uh, I'm not suggesting you, you asked a question and I've, I've not answered in the infirm affirmative. Um, I, I think if we had the circumstance, specific circumstances, the short answer is uh, no, there is no absolute, if that's the answer you're looking for. All right. Does the church undergo any kind of uh, risk assessment process where you look at the activities you're involved in and apply a, a process by which you assess both the risk to your own people and the risk to the community that your own people may, um, may present to them, such as being present in their, in their homes? Um, if, uh, if you're asking about have we engaged or done a, an, an external risk assessment, uh, I don't know. Uh, Do you recognise that it, it, that it may in some circumstances be a risk to the public sending out um, uh, people into people's homes who may have previous criminal histories for violent offences, say? I think that's a valid question that applies across the community in, in every walk of life. Um, Mr Spinks, I'm not asking you about across the community. I'm asking you about Jehovah's Witness practices. Again, your, your, question, uh, your question is fairly, fairly sweeping and I think it does apply to the, the broad um, community. Are you saying is there a risk in any case of somebody who has um, committed a sin or a crime in their past uh, being some risk to the public, um, I'd have to say absolutely yes with Jehovah's Witnesses or any other um, organisation or individual. Right. Uh, could I ask you to look at paragraph 73 of your first statement about 
elders. Um, Mr. Spinks, you set out in that statement, if that could be brought up. All right, I think I've got it anyway. There are a number of considerations and characteristics of a, peop of a person, of a man, before they can become an elder. And I think the number six is presiding over his own household in a fine manner. Now, that comes from Timothy 3, 2, but it's not a complete stating of what Timothy says on that point, is it? Uh, can I read it in context? Yes, of course. So it's an open expression in the middle of a series of verses. That's right. what was your question? All right. Uh, Timothy 2 says, uh, in describing the characteristics of an overseer or an elder, uh, a man presiding over his own household in a fine manner, as you've stated, and then there is a comma and it says, having his children in subjection with all seriousness. What does that mean to you? What does having your children in subjection, subjection mean? mean? Um, I would suggest exactly as it says that the, uh, I don't think any caring parent would see it otherwise that children are subject to the care and authority. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.